to Google today. Uh, is a physical chemist uh, from from Wisconsin, but he's been working for the Yahoo for quite some time. <laughs> And, which is always challenging work, but Mike's always been a person that helped uh, sort of cut through the red tape and, and get really interesting programs going, uh, working with the scientists. And so please get to us about some of those. Uh, I feel like I'm talking to an empty room. Why do I feel like I'm talking to an empty room? All right, I, I thought what I'd try to do today, Brett invited me to try to give you some idea about why we support uh, informatics research at uh, NIH. We actually support quite a bit of informatics research at NIH. Um, most of you probably aren't familiar with NIH, so let me tell you, National Institutes of Health is the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. Our annual budget is $30 billion. And almost all of that, 85% of it is sent out to universities and academic health centers for conducting research. So we spend a lot of money supporting research throughout the country. Of that money, we conservatively estimate that 500 million a year goes into information technology research activities. Now, that's a lot of different things. It isn't just, it very little of it, it's actually computer science, but some of it is. Uh, some of it is software development, some of it is development of databases. So there are a lot of different things. My own estimate is that the 500 million a year is conservative. That's what we formally report through the government. Um, but that in, in a relatively short time, something like 20 or 25 percent of our budget will be invested in information technology activities. Now, that doesn't mean just information technology research. It means maybe supporting clinical studies, and 10 percent of their budget will be devoted to databasing and, and uh, uh, curation of data and that sort of thing. But, there is a, a, there's an enormous amount of money here to be invested in and spent wisely. And what I'm going to try to do for you today is, in a, in a short time, do uh, two things. I want to give you an idea of what motivates us to, to do in information technology research. So I want to just kind of walk through a couple problems of interest uh, that are important biological problems. I'm assuming that. Most of you aren't biologists, is that right? Is there a biologist in the audience? There's no biologist in the audience. So I'm, I, I, may, I started out with that assumption that mo nobody was a biologist. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to try to tell you the kinds of problems and give you some inkling of why the insight of information technology, whether it's computation, whether it's simulation, whether it's modeling, whether it's database activities, are necessary to, do, to meet those challenges that we, we see today. So I'm going to outline the challenges in a bunch of different areas by listing the problems, more or less. Then I'm going to focus on one area in more detail, uh, what we are calling data-centric uh, science, science that depends on large amounts of data, both visualizing the data, computing with the data, um, uh, visualizing it, curating it, displaying it, analyzing it, so forth. And I'm going to describe for you some of the investments we've made. But I honestly think that what's happening in the commercial sector with Google and, and I don't know whether I'm allowed to say Amazon and Yahoo and those sorts of things, but they're, they're all doing things involved in, in cloud computing, which is going to significantly uh, change the way we do business and allow us to realign our investments so that we can more um, efficiently take advantage of these opportunities that exist in the commercial market that Google uh, it may be leading the way in. And then finally, and I, I probably won't do this, but I have, so I have a total of about 40 slides. 20 slides are, are just what I talked about now. 20 slides are just kind of once through quickly of one pagers of a bunch of centers that we support. We support a whole lot of centers, a lot of them here in California, a number of at Stanford. Uh, for example, that, that are focused on specific problem areas, a lot of often software development. And we fund these at something like a million to three million or four million dollars a year to collect the necessary students and postdocs and faculty to, to, to uh, under, in, undertake those efforts. So with that, moving, let me just move quickly into some of the areas. I can see that doesn't work from here unless I point my computer, right? Isn't that? Interesting. 
I want to, yeah. So I've just made this statement. I'm issuing it as that the biomedical informatics, and when we mean by biomedic, we use the term biomedical informatics to distinguish a number of different terms that are commonly used in the, in the community. People use bioinformatics. People use information technology. People use, we use the general term biomedical informatics to refer to computation and simulation to modeling, the use of computers for modeling. And we distinguish between simulation and modeling in that modeling is often exploiting and are helping us assemble the, uh, assimilate the data we've taken. And then the data-centric science for collaboration that I'm going to describe. And this is, this is the newest area and probably the most uh, rapidly developing area in the, the biomedical research community. And the area where I, I see us investing billions of dollars over the next each year, relatively shortly. So I've just taken some clips here, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I, I wanted to give you a flavor of these. This is from the uh, uh, Science, the 125th uh, anniversary issue of Science, in which they outline the 125 big science questions. Of those, big science questions are things like dark matter and a bunch of astronomical questions. But a large fraction of them, maybe something just under half of them, of those 125, are in the biomedical region. This is the areas where there's a lot of challenging unknowns. And on the next two slides, I've just selected and copied from the article the sidebars that give the names of the, of the problems. And these are in the molecular area, largely. There are things like, what's the origin of homochirality? What it keeps intercellular traffic running smoothly? Why are some genomes big and others compact? How many technologies lower, how to, well, that's another. So these are areas that each of these areas, without too much difficulty, I could convince you that there's a big component of computation or simulation or modeling or combining lots of data in order to make progress in understanding or dealing with that major problem. Here's the second major problem. Here's a second set of, and so this, this was a total of 24 of the 125. What triggers puberty? There's a question that, <laughs> what, if we knew what triggered puberty, maybe we'd avoid uh, uh, triggering it going the other direction, right? How many, how do vertebrates depend on innate immune systems to fight infection? Immune system's a huge, complex system that will never be understood without detailed computer models to help us grasp these things. Anybody that wades into the immune literature rapidly runs into what I call the anti-language. It's just so confusing. So many things happening. This is a couple of this, change this, two more things happen over here. And, and trying to grasp and keep all of that stuff before us is going to require the development of detailed computer models. These are, this, this is the second 12 I've shown you. If I had shown you the other, there's 24, 48 more, 24 model, that all have to do with diseases, specific diseases. And I would argue that the computer informatics here, biomedical informatics, is going to be the key to understanding how these diseases, what the, the source of these diseases, the etiology of these diseases, etiology of these diseases, and the cures, because so many of them are related to the genes or to the proteome, to the proteins that are expressed in doing this. Ah, move to the end. I get rid of these funny uh, transitions. I only did one here. So one of the major here, what I've taken here are a few areas just to give you a sense of what are the research areas. Again, I'm focusing here on what motivates us to fund computing centers, modeling centers, centers that are doing simulations, centers that are collecting data in a meaningful way and allowing us. So in the narrow area of bioinformatics, one list of things, I think this is a Wikipedia list, in fact. If you do Wikipedia bioinformatics, this will be a list of things that you'll get. Analysis of gene expression, high throughput image analysis, prediction of protein structure. All of these areas are intense computational areas, require substantial involvement of computing resources, considerable sophistication in terms of uh, software development and algorithms. I want to mention one area that some of you probably have never heard of called metagenomics. And it, it's an interesting area. It's a recently emerging area. Um, 
there's a fellow named Craig Venter, who was the head of the Geno human, the, Juma, the Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research. He's just founded a new institute out at UC San Diego devoted to metagenomics, which is an intense computational effort. It's so centered at San Diego because the supercomputer center is there, and they had a great deal of computer expertise, which would allow him to take these advances in bioinformatics. And, and in metagenomics, it was the bioinformatics, the capabilities that allowed for both DNA refinement, amplification, but most importantly, for shotgun analysis. So the way people sequence genes today is not just take a long gene and march through and figure out what the sequence is. What they do is they just take a mess of genes, chop them all up, and look at little segments of those genes and sequence maybe 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 length, which is a very small fraction overall. They do thousands of these fractions, and then they use computers to line them up and figure out where they overlap and ultimately figure out what the full sequence is. In metagenomics, is a, is a brand new feeling, field where they took, they are able to take environmental samples. It used to be that in order to sequence something, you had to take a single organism, grow it up to a huge amount of it, so you could extract enough of the same kind of DNA to do analyses of. Now we can work with individual cells, and in fact, what they do is they just take a gamish of cells, chop, extract the DNA from all of them, chop it all up, sequence all those pieces, and then use the computer to puzzle together which parts of them go together and how many different organisms were even in there to begin with. This is a major insight. And here are some of the observations that were made in just the last few years. In uh, 2002, an environmental shotgun sequencing was able to show that 200 liters of seawater, just collected in seawater, had 5,000 different, vi different viruses. The total number of viruses, we used to say, I used to work in a marine organism area, and it used to say a liter of water contains a million viruses. Now that probably seems, I, I always stunned me when I, when I recognize that. If you just take a liter of water, you collect a million viruses out of the middle of the ocean, not by the, uh, where the, the treatment plant, sewage treatment plant releases, out in the middle of the ocean. So he collected, this is a Ventner project, 200 liters, and a 200 liter sample found 5,000 different viruses. There were many, many more than 5,000, 200 million probably. But 5,000 different viruses, many of them unknown, had never been seen before because they were very small. He yeah, showed that there are over 1,000 virus species in a human stool. That gives you pause for thought. So we're surrounded by, and, in, and in a, there are a million different viruses in a kilogram of, of uh, two pounds of marine sediment. That's, that's amazing. So these organisms are virtually unknown un until this type of process, which is enabled by com computational capabilities only, can never be done without them. This enables to ask questions and to look at things we've never been able to look at before, and we're finding astounding things. These organisms in the sea, for example, just in the sea, have dramatic effects on health. They have dramatic effects on weather. The global change environment is heavily engaged in trying to understand what those organisms are and how they, these are just the virus, viral ends of it, not the bacterial or the small organisms. So without the computing capabilities, we'd never even been able to do these sorts of things. <clears throat> Here's a list of challenges that all have computational components. This is from a meeting that Brett Peterson here organized uh, last year, or two, yeah, two, well, it's, oh, 2006, more than last year now at NIH, uh, sponsored by the Computing Research Association, which was aimed at trying to figure out where computer challenges could, uh, what are the computer-assisted cha computer challenges in biomedical research. And here is one, invent one of the participants' list. This is John Woolley, and he, he headed up one of the teams and the working groups that tried to put together. And I'm not going to read these to you or even go through them, but suffice it to say that there are substantial numbers of things that we cannot do today that we would like to do having to do with the structures of genes and the structures of proteins that, that without, computer, without investments in computer technologies, software and hardware, we aren't going to be able to handle these sorts of things. So we're talking about some major changes which are going to be precipitated by the development of this technology. And as often as true, in, in, especially true in biomedical research, but it's all true in all research, is new techniques and new technologies 
often bring greater insights and allow us to ask new questions that have never been thought of before. Sometimes these questions, there's no reason to pose these questions if you have no ways to answer them. But with the computer technology, we now are beginning to having ways of, of hopefully addressing these kinds of questions. Here's a graph also by John Woolley, though published a number of years ago, but earlier, which tries to convey something about the complexity. One of the reasons biomedical research is so much more difficult than, say, something simple like high energy physics. It, it, it causes many more domains of scale in length and scale in time. So many of the activities, they range from the small activities, atomic activities on the lower end, to very large long-term activities that are almost geologic in time on the upper right hand. In the, in the ovals that are listed in color there are areas where we have, begin to make, have begun to make headway. And almost all the headway in those particular areas that are cited are done by computer models or simulation capabilities. So we go from the beginning to where you actually do quantum computing, computing of the individual molecular properties from the atomic properties to the molecular dynamics. We recently had one of our investigators at the center was able to successfully dynamically model the behavior of, a, of, a, of an entire virus. And, and there are a whole bunch of questions about viral behavior and pathogenicity, which are dependent upon its, its dynamic behavior and cannot be studied. There are no techniques for studying it, so it's required that we do computation and then suggest things that might be experimentally done to confirm the computations. The areas in the boxes are areas in those space, in the time scale, length scale region that try to give you protein folding occurs in this time length and on this time, and this time length and this length scale for large complexes down to small complexes. And those are areas where we haven't really made much progress at all. All of these areas are areas in this complexity diagram which require investment in computation areas. Many of these particular are computational biology. Some of them are uh, modeling and, or simulation. So <clears throat> continuing on the why, why we do these things, this is uh, the sidebar from an article in Nature which appeared in 2006 the title of which was, it was an issue devoted to scientific computing. And these are the milestones, the major milestones by that author's, the, the set of authors that produced this. Their idea of what was the major milestones in scientific computing since nine, over the last 50 or more years, right? 2006, 1946. Some of you will recognize Berners-Lee here as one of the highlights, not surprisingly. Let me highlight for you just a few others that are present in this. Down in the bottom, we have John Kendrew he uses computers for the first time to build the first atomic model of, of um, myoglobin from crystallographic data. This, uh, the top one is a particular pleasing one to me because the, the center with which I'm associated with at NIH funded this work by Charles Molnar and Wesley Clark and also by Jerry Fox later at WashU on the development of the Link computer. This was in 1962. We supported the Link computer development, which was, a, I, 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 as a graduate student, actually got to work on one. And it was this massive bunch of tapes and, and it had a lot of A to D converters. And it was used for, in laboratories, neurophysiological data, data laboratories, for collecting data and storing it in digital format. This, by the way, that effort led to the formation of that wonderful company, Digital Equipment Corporation, which doesn't exist anymore. but. That was the precursor to that company. And it was all founded out of biomedical research. Of course, the computing power shows that for medical imagery is you see these images all the time. But the amazing thing is, is that we, have, we are at the point where we can image your thinking processes. And that's truly amazing to me. I, I mean, I just, it's like moonshots and uh, weather radars. And I, 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 we see them all the time, so people get inured to these things. But I'm still amazed by these things. And this is an amazing thing that we can do. And again, that's strongly, strongly computer related. Uh, let's see. My, the Protein Data Bank was first established in 1971. That's the first big general database. This is before the Gene Bank. We didn't know very much about genes in 1971. Uh, this was in 1990. This work was done. 
largely, bo well, both on both coasts. It was done at NIH and it was also done at UC Santa, uh, Santa Cruz, that using the development of a program called Basic Local Alignment and Search, BLAST. And these are the things where you try to compare a sequence here with a sequence from another, a protein sequence from another organism and say, do they have the same protein in them? Well, of course, they don't always have the same protein they, or the same set of genes. What they do is, is they, have, they have small variations. So you have to make allowances for uh, things that have been inserted or things that have been removed and look for alignment. So this is kind of a fuzzy alignment. And as you can imagine, this is, it can be fairly computer intensive. It's also a process that can be highly parallelized. And so the, the evolution of parallel computers has significantly advanced our abilities to work with BLAST. And in fact, this is the precursor of the work that enabled the shotgun sequencing that I referred to in metagenomics that has allowed us in the last few years to discover all these amazing facts about how many organisms were such a minority in this world. And, and, and the truth be known, number-wise, you have more, more bacteria in you than you do human cells by number count. And the reason you can, I can say that is, is bacteria are quite a bit smaller than human cells, so they don't outweigh you. They're about 10% of your mass, but, but they're more than uh, 10 times the, uh, your number. Um, I have one more. Is there one more? Oh, one, uh, that Craig Ventner develops a shotgun technique. I've already mentioned that. And I'm going to describe this one in a little more detail because this takes me into the area. This is an investment that Brett Peterson right here, when he worked at NIH, was a major player in developing this program to try to provide the initial infrastructure needed by scientists that would allow them to both share the tool, to integrate data across different laboratories, and then to provide access to analysis tools using what we think of today as web service or uh, web, web services. So I mentioned that one other use of computers is visualization. I just wanted to give two examples of visualization. These visualization, this is a, uh, from Chris Johnson at Utah at a center that we support there. And it's just giving a variety of examples of imaging the head or the human brain. And it's interesting, how each of these modalities brings out different features of the data. So visualization is a way of dealing with complex data in a context of a subject. And so th there is a, a great deal of an effort, great deal of effort involved in finding new and interesting ways to, to, to be able to display the complex data so that we can begin to understand what it is we're collecting. I'll say more about complex data in a minute because I'm going to come to the data-centric thing. This is a second. Um, well, this is the wall. They call this the wall. It's a series of monitors that are synced together and provide a massive image. These are the bezels between the individual monitors, and it's driven by a single image. But these huge images, besides being glitzy and gee whiz sorts of things, allow scientists to take a global view and recognize systematic variations. In this case, they understood that there were tra channels across these. This is a a uh, blow up of a, a slice of a brain at a level where this is the membrane. And there are, uh, the colors are, are due to specific binding fluorescent probes, which identify different uh, types of molecules. So these are lipids, and this is uh, glial cells and so forth. Uh, and they were able to recognize a regularity in channels that across this wider array that had never been recognized until they were able to display all the data, because everybody had been looking like this before and never been able to look at enough resolution over a wide enough area to be able to obtain the regularities that exist and for which there's deeper meaning. And we now know there's deeper meaning. So it's as if you looked at a Google map and you looked at everything at the lowest level at the two block square thing and you had to look across the country. You, well, first of all, it take a long time. But secondly, you never really get the broad perception of how far you are from this, this city or that city or so forth. It never get anywhere either, I can, <laughs> I'm sure. So <clears throat> one of the things that I've been hinting at and I want to now focus a little bit on is the emergence of what we're referring to or lots of people are referring to as a data-centric science. This is from uh, a talk given by Tony Hay, but it's uh, several of us have made these same observation. I just lifted the slide from him, so I'm citing him. Tony gave a very nice talk at the Global Grid Forum this past summer in which he cited a lot of the data-centric uh, 
issues. And of course, since he's now at Microsoft, Microsoft's focus on how they think they can help the world do these sorts of things. He also had some kind of pointed remarks to make about Google. So you might Google Tony Hay and Global Grid Forum and take a look at this talk for yourself, or I have a copy of it. It's, it's publicly available. Um, so we outlined the different kinds of eras of science from the early stages of experimental science, where one looked to see what happened, theoretical science, computational science, to the science of today, which is heavily data-centric science. And this is a, a feature that I think is, is patently true. But it's also, I think, um, I often refer to my colleagues at the National Institutes of Health as being having an Egyptian problem because they're in a constant state of denial about this problem. They just do not appreciate the massive amounts of data that we're, we're generating, nor do, they, nor do most people even appreciate how much data is being lost. So the, the truth is we generate our laboratories, many of the laboratories today, easily generate a terabyte of information a day. That's a phenomenal amount of information. And, and the brain images that we were, I was talking about earlier are a petabyte. Some of them are almost a petabyte in information. Now, that, those are very extraordinary cases. Mostly they're, they're on the order of gigabytes to terabytes. The brain, the brain scan you get when you, when you went to the doctor was more like a gigabyte. But, but uh, the highest resolution research images now are approaching terabytes and will soon approach petabytes. And we often forget about how, I mean, you guys don't forget about how big information is, but most of the people I talk to don't think very hard about a petabyte. But I tell them a petabyte is a lot of information. This is the Jim Gray uh, Databrick uh, story. Even with these advances in, in uh, high-speed networks, at 10 gigabits per second, it still takes 12 days to archive a petabyte. At 10 gigabits per second, 12 days to archive a petabyte. So we throw petabytes around a lot, but, but in truth, we have to use the data at its remote site. We're not going to be moving petabytes or even exabytes around in any, in any of our lifetimes, I think, no matter how fast these things develop. But I want to say, well, I keep forgetting over here. Some of you, many of you have seen these kinds of data. This is, is just one of many different forms of, of the GWOW sorts of things. I'm plotting exabytes on the vertical axis. This is taken from uh, Lask and uh, Landauer. They, this is, there's a site at Berkeley which says how much information. I think it's most recently updated about 2003. But they did some very careful assessments somewhere around 2002, somewhere in here, and doing some extrapolations. Other people have tried to uh, certify these things. This was actually presented quite recently and I, by, by a fellow at IBM who had made some effort, Tom, uh, Robert Morris, who had made some efforts to try to, to uh, verify some of the data beyond 2003. But, even if you blur your eyes, these data numbers are enormous. So this, this is a log scale, right? This is the years. This is what we say is all you, can learn, all you could learn in a year. All you could learn in a year. Maybe I could learn in a year. Maybe you can be a little bit higher, but it is a log scale. Um, all human words ever spoken at this level here, all human documents, we're talking about 10 exabytes. Now, you know and I know that how that information is, is gathered, there are a lot of iffies, but it might be off by a factor of two or pi, but it's not off by a factor of 10 or more. So these are enormous numbers, all disk storage. And this, gives, this is the number that gives you the exponential growth of information. So as of somewhere in here, we were producing more information each year than all human documents prior in all history. And, well, that's 40, 40 th years, 40,000 years, but that's for all practical purposes, all our recorded history of, and beyond. So we know we're producing a lot of information, so the, that's a point that needs to be, be said. Before I talk about how to deal with this, the use of the networks, the communications, the high-speed computing, and the data sources, I just wanted to refer back while I was going through, I ran across this quote from Licklitter. Does anybody know who Licklitter is, J.C.R. Licklitter? He died in 1990, but he was at ARPA in the, I think, 40 years ago, probably, almost 40 years ago. 
and he was involved in development of the, of the Internet. And this is a quote from him. I don't have the precise date, but it's in the 60s sometime, I think. And it's an amazingly prescient quote, I think, as far as how we see today the beauty and advantage, of, how I see it anyway, the beauty and advantage of the Internet. All the stuff linked together throughout the world. You can use a remote computer, get data from a remote computer, and use lots of computers in your job. That's actually a quote from him 40 years ago. You know he was a prescient guy. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of the data size. <clears throat> One of the things that we're faced with in biomedical research is, as I mentioned, is that we're collecting enormous amounts of data. This is just an example from brain data, but it, it, we could use lots of other areas. So these data from a brain where you can take a cellular level till you get down to the, almost the molecular way, this electron microscope, this is optical, this is MRI imaging. But if you have a full brain imaged at millimeter resolution in color, it's four and a half megabytes. 10 micron, which is still far from molecular, is four and a half terabytes. And if you're operating at micron level, which is still above molecular, it's four and a half petabytes. That's a huge amount of information, huge amount of information. Remember 12 days to back up at 10 gigabits per second? We're also dealing with enormously complex data, and it's heterogeneous. So the challenge to us is not only to dealing with massive amounts of data, it's massive amounts of different kinds of data. So we look to people in the geosciences and the high energy physics community and the astronomy who have been handling massive amounts of data for a long time. And we look to them for guidance for how to proceed. But in truth, all of the data they have is trivial. It's all the same kind. It's on the same scale. It's modestly homogeneous. Sometimes it's a little more. I was just up at the high energy physics group in Stanford yesterday, and they were describing how much data and the different kinds of data they're getting. So it, it's still a difficult problem, but it's nowhere near as mixed as the kinds of data that we're getting. And these are just some examples of data that, of the types of data. Metabolomic data, that is how we break down chemicals in our cells. Protein interactions, regulatory bio alignment, disease, motifs, protein classifications. These are all data that are being collected and generated in laboratories across the country and for which we at NIH are paying for a lot of it. We spend billions, tens of billions of dollars collecting this data. You know what? First of all, most of this data will never ever be seen by a human. There's too much of it. Nobody can look at this data. So, and secondly, most of the data will never be seen by anybody or any machine. So it's wasted. It's collected and gone. So we have a real challenge to try to take this information, begin to make use of it in ways other than the narrow uses for which it was originally collected. If we want to share data, collect data on genomic data or distribution in one animal and see how it applies to another animal or to another human, we need to be able to preserve that data. We need to be able to check the data. And if, as I said, none of the data we are collecting, most of the data, well, for all practical purposes, none of the data will ever be seen by a human. If you don't see that data, just think all the problems that presents. You're going to have to figure out how to check whether the data is worthwhile, whether it's the data you really want. Is it, is it left-handed data and meant, and meant to be right-handed data? You have to have machine algorithms which can anticipate all those kinds of questions and certify that the data is what you're looking for and it's a quality that you need. Those are enormous problems, and those are the kinds of problems that we're beginning to, well, not beginning, but have been, and we're increasing our investment to try to manage and figure out global ways to be able to respond to those needs. There are also barriers to, the, to efficient data use. The nomenclature and coordination, everybody calls something differently. So this, this is the issue of developing ontologies. Uh, in the, in the biomedical arena, we have an enormous problem having to do with privacy. We have to have consent of the patients, if it's a patient's data, for that data to be used for the purpose that it's which it's used. So there's a long trail of tracking about consenting data. There's the uh, best practices and culture gaps. Culture gaps is a big one and one that we, informatics isn't going to solve, but it's a huge problem having to do with people. We always make the joke that we say that uh, uh, many biomedical scientists think of data mining as data mine. Now, 
not to be shared because they want to make advantage of it before anybody else does. So I'm going to describe for you briefly in, in four slides here, and then I'm going to kind of end up. Uh, what are uh, an effort that Brett and, uh, and others, but mostly Brett, put together to try to begin to handle how do we share data and how do we, how do we collaborate and deal with in, the infrastructure necessary to uh, deal with these monstrous data. So we put together something called the Biomedical Informatics Research Network. And we intentionally used the term biomedical informatics because included in this network would be resources that allowed for storage of data, resources that permitted computation on those data, assembling computers, supercomputers, accessing clusters that were available on the network, and allowing them in a transparent way to be used by individuals who would put together pipelines of data, say take data from A, B, C, and D, merge that data, bring it together, perform these analyses, which might include anonymization of the data, might include normalization of the data, might include referencing it to an atlas, and then would include some computation on that data to uh, determine whether or not uh, there was a difference in size between in the pituitary gland of individuals that are affected by Alzheimer's. For example, that might be something we'd do. And there's appropriate infrastructure, software infrastructure, that involves various levels of middleware on top of hardware and networking. Now, the interesting thing to me is, is that we've invested in all of these things. We've paid for the hardware. We've supported the networking connections, gotten by the firewalls at all the institutions, a pain in the butt, put together middleware to help people to access the different computers in a transparent way to sign on, build in authentication, authorization activities, accounting activities, all of those things that who's used what data when. And then on top of that, we finally get to the scientific and applications pipelines, which allow us to do things interesting with the data to the scientist, figure out whether the data is the same, ask questions about whether uh, something that occurs in one animal also occurs in humans whether this protein is similar to this protein, whether this set of genes is contributing to this, uh, this particular disease type. Those kinds of questions are all at the top of this. I'm thinking, and many of us have been thinking, that most of this part of this grid, of this, this uh, pyramid here, is going to be, we've often wondered, how can we continue to support this? Our, our, our critical feature has always been, we want this, whatever we invest, to both scale and to be extensible to other systems that it was built to, to address. Um, this is critical. Scalability is not the kind of thing your average biomedical researcher thinks about. In fact, most biomedical researchers can't tell you what scalability means. So we've thought a lot about how we do this, to scale this. And we hadn't come to decent solutions except for the, oh, then, when is it, the deus ex machina? And then a miracle happens. <laughs> and we thought maybe things would take care of it. Well, you know something? A miracle has happened in the last several years. We've seen the emergence of cloud computing here. We've seen it at Amazon. We've seen it at, we've, seen, we've begun to see it at Microsoft even. Amazing. And we've, and we've seen it at Yahoo. That kind of computing, the support of resources and computational resources, which will permit large virtual organizations, and what we're doing here is assembling virtual organizations that have a common interest in data and research and analysis tools and, and a computational need to apply those tools. We're assembling that group, and we're assembling it over an infrastructure that we've been providing in hard, concrete terms but there's no reason that virtual organization shouldn't be supported on a virtual set of resources. So it's my belief that the emergence of many of our problems and the address of many of our problems, we're going to see very active pursuit of those virtual or utility computing or cloud computing type of activities. And our investment is going to shift to focus on those areas that have to do with the, the knowledge management, the the uh, data mining, the uh, integration tools that are, that are thorny issues, but issues that can be done. And we, look, we hope that places like Google are going to be able to, to uh, lead the way and uh, provide that kind of, of uh, activity and entree for these data. So let me close with that.
Uh, uh, let me close with this. This is just to give you an idea, it's a reality check. This is a group, some of you may know about techcast.org. This is an organization that makes its living making predictions and, and selling subscriptions to these reports that they write. But they provide a little bit online for free, and I've clipped these from their web pages to, uh, for their free parts of their web pages. And it gives you a little bit of idea that they plot the most likely to enter the mainstream against the uh, expert's estimate of the, of the likelihood that it'll occur. And the grid computing, you can see up here, is in the 2010 frame, frame a little over 2010 with an 80% certainty. And I would, that sounds about right. I mean, we can do grid computing now, but, but in terms of the mainstream, they're talking about entering the mainstream. We're talking about three years from now, two years from now. And I think that's about right. So we're, we're already behind the power curve in getting the tools to make use of that grid computing. It's also interesting, some of these other things, if you look over in there, they had one that just had to do with uh, medical research. And they call telemedicine, not what I call telemedicine, but they call telemedicine the, the access to health records and, and prescription records and things like that. And they think it's not even going to be close to available until 2015. And you know, there's a lot of people working on that, and it's a very big monetary market. The other thing they do is give you the sizes of markets for these things in their analyses, and it's quite, it's quite amazing. So with that, I think I'll close, and I'll skip going through the details of the. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to. Shoot. Um, well, um, are, are there any computer architectures um, that would fit some of these problems better that are not well proposed? Or are there missing architectures? So one of the areas that we're investing in is the. So oh, repeat. Are there any? Yeah. The, repeat the question is: Are there any architectures that would address these problems better than the existing architectures? So I want to say FSMGs. Is that the the FPGAs? Right. FP, FSMGs. FPGAs. Having a morning uh, East Coast thing. So there are two or three groups uh, working on FPGAs in an attempt to address specific computational problems, and there are specific data storage structures. Um, that um, are being proposed and developed commercially to try to enhance the ability to select data and do local computations on, as part of the database structure. Um, but they're not widespread. I believe they're very early in the development, from what I know of it. Do you? Hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have one investigator, Klaus Schulten, at the University of Illinois. He's also doing FPGAs, by the way as part of his project. But he recently, uh, I wish I could remember those numbers. He, he's been working with NVIDIA and taking some of their processors to do molecular dynamics calculations. So these are highly paralyzable calculations that look at how molecules basically vibrate under potentials, defined potentials. And uh, for very large molecules, like, and he was the one that did the virus, so very large collections of atoms. And he's been using, uh, he, he has worked with NVIDIA to get their, uh, to teach a course, had gotten ex, uh, uh, executives from their scientific end of the NVIDIA to teach a course at Illinois with them, fly out each week to teach a course about how to program these things, because the programming is largely undocumented. And he, he's published, he just published some of this stuff where he's done four NVIDIA processors and gets a couple of teraflops, as I remember, from four processors, which is pretty amazing. I mean, because the cost is, the total cost of the things is a couple thousand dollars. So, and those are dedicated to doing molecular, highly paralyzable molecular dynamics calculations. So it's conceivable that that isn't a new computer structure, it just happens to be a very high speed programmable um, processor designed by the gaming industry, right? Do you know of any? No. no. Not your field, but any other questions? No? Is design age? They give grants to private institutions. Absolutely. You mean like Google? Yeah, I'm just curious. How does it work? 
<clears throat> so here's a guy working at Google who worked at NIH. But yeah, people make application. They're, you have to write applications. Um, we have small business applications. People from Google wouldn't be eligible for that. But people can write applications from research applications and secure funding for specific projects. I think it'd be rare. I don't, I don't, can't ever remember getting one from. <sighs> oh, right. And so, and there's also regular issues of rest, request, request for proposals, which are then awarded, or request for, request for proposals. We distinguish between request for proposals and request for applications. Request for proposals mean we're, we're interested in awarding a contract. And we award contracts when we have a product in mind. So we can specify what the deliverables are. We award grants, and we have requests for applications. We award grants when we don't know what we're doing. You know, we can't, we can't specify what the product is. So, and formally a grant is for the benefit of mankind, and the contract is for the benefit of NIH. Right, that's the formal distinction between the two. Anything else? Well, thanks for your attention.